we have uh, we started a series called the family table and last week we learned that, that God is inviting everyone to the table his table to a feast that he has prepared he is ready to provide every need he is ready to provide everything that would satisfy uh, the longings in your soul he's looking for people with desire and he's looking for people that are ready to respond to the invitation. And so we, uh, we saw the, the parable of Jesus as he was uh, speaking uh, about uh, this man that was throwing a feast. And he said, go out into the highways and the byways. Go out into the country roads and find the poor, find the crippled, find the lame. Find everyone who wasn't invited the first go around. Uh, forget the people that said they couldn't come. I want everybody who is hungry, everybody that's looking for uh, something that can satisfy them, bring them to the party. I want my house to be full. And, uh, and Jesus made that comparison to the kingdom of heaven. And he's basically saying, look, I want everyone uh, to be a part of what I am doing. And, and so I believe that I, I'm filled with expectation for uh, not just this service today, but for not just for this series, but for what God is uh, beginning to do uh, in this place. And so very excited to see you here today. Uh, today, uh, the message is very simple. We had the invitation last week. Uh, this week is set the table. Set the table. I'm a preacher. I have to say it twice. I don't know why we do that, but we do. You know, whatever. When you make a point, and you want everybody to know it. You say it one more time, just for effect. But uh, this is, uh, and so I have a, have a table here, and it is set. It is in preparation for what God is getting ready to do. I I hope that you came here today with some expectation. I hope you came here today, uh, saying, you know, I I don't really know what to expect, but I expect something to happen, and uh, I'm looking forward to God uh, moving in my life. And so, uh, to kind of set the stage for this. For this message, I wanted to start with a story. I like to start with stories. I know you like stories, so I'm going to tell you a story. It's a true story. It's a story about my grandfather and my grandmother. And so my grandfather and my grandmother, you know, the year was 1960. So well before I was born, maybe before some of you were born, maybe not, but 1960. And they had decided that God was calling them to build a church. They didn't call it church planting back then. But they, they felt the call of God to go down into South Louisiana to a city called Thibodeau, Louisiana. You can look it up on the map. You'll see exactly where that is. Uh, Thibodeau, Louisiana. And so they moved there in 1960, and they get a trailer in a trailer park at the edge of, I kid you not, Devil's Swamp. And so if you're going to build a church, why not just build it right in the devil's backyard, right? So literally called Devil Swamp, that's where they were, and a little 10 by 36 trailer. It was my grandfather, my grandmother, and three young children. And so they're there, and they're working on building a church. And so he's working as a mechanic. Uh, wages are low, work is slim, and times are tough. And he comes home one day, and... He asks his wife, what's for dinner? Well, I've I'm, I'm been working all day. I'm hungry. You know, what's, I'm, I'm ready for something to eat. What, what's for dinner? And she looks back at him and says, there's nothing in this house to eat. There's nothing to prepare to eat. And even if there was food in the pantry, even if there was something in the refrigerator, there's no gas to cook it with. All of our butane is, is gone as well. And so they looked in their money stash, and there wasn't anything in there either to go buy something. And so my grandfather did what my grandfather knew to do. And that is he went to his room at the other end of the trailer. It was only 30-something feet away. But he walked down there, closed the door, and knelt down to pray. And he prayed in there for just a few minutes. And he came, he came out of the room, and he looked at my grandmother, and he said... God said to set the table. And she looked at him. I, I, I talked with him this week. He was recounting the story to me. He says, I remember when she looked at me and said, what do you mean, set the table? He said, set the table. And so she set the table, just like you have here in front of you. Plates, knives, forks, spoons. There was ice in the glasses. And that was it. And he looked across the the table and looked at the three small children sitting there, looked at his wife there and said, now let's, let's pray. And they bowed their heads and they said grace over the empty plate and the empty glass. And when he said amen, he looked up and he said, all I could see was three pairs of hungry eyes looking back at me. And then suddenly somebody said, 
who's that coming down the road? And they looked out the window, and there was a person walking down the road with a big bag in their hands and a pitcher. And they walked right up to the door, and they knocked on the door. My grandfather went to the door, and it went something like this. Hi, my name is Cecile, and my husband and I were cooking dinner. Uh, he went fishing today, and he caught a whole lot of fish, and so I cooked them up Creole style. And uh, so we, got, we have a lot of fish left over. We have French fries and hush puppies and, and, uh, and a big pitcher of tea. I, I was just thinking that maybe since you're the newcomers here, you would, you'd like to try some Creole cooking. And he said, lady, you don't even know. You don't even know. And so he, he took the food graciously. They sat at the table, and they had themselves a feast. Uh, can I tell you that God is a provider? Can I tell you that God uh, has never left the righteous begging for bread? That God always has something ready for you. And all you have to do is have the faith to expect it. And uh, today, I want to encourage you, I want to build you up in your faith to set the table in your life. I don't know what, that's going to look different for each person uh, here today. Uh, God has something that's a little different for each person in this place today. But I invite you to go ahead and begin to prepare yourself now to set the table for what God is getting ready to do. And, and so uh, Jesus, uh, we talked about Jesus last week uh, in the story where he goes into his hometown and he goes into the synagogue and he was sitting there and you remember the story, they gave him the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and it was his turn to read and so he got up and he began to read, this, the anointing of the Lord is upon me, uh, I'm, I'm here to, to preach to the poor, to the captive, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to, to proclaim the acceptable of the year of the Lord. And he, so he's going through all these, these prophecies. And he says, uh, and then he sits down. And everyone's looking at him. He says, this day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears. And they all started looking at him like, really? What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? This prophecy is fulfilled. This is something that is for the Messiah, and we know who you are. You're, you're Jesus. You're the son of Joseph. We, we watched you grow up. We, we know who you are. What do you mean this, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears? And, and so he goes on in, in, in Luke 4 and 24. He says, I tell you the truth. No prophet is acceptable or in, his own, in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Elijah's days when the sky was shut up three and a half years. There was a, a famine over the whole land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of the widows. He wasn't sent to any of the widows in Israel. He was only sent to a woman who was a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And yet none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. You see, what he was telling them is that in Israel there was this famine. And the people that God chose to provide for were not the Israelites, they were people that were considered foreigners. There was a widow uh, who lived in a foreign city. There was uh, a military man who was from Syria, and God reached down to touch them. And when the people heard this in his hometown, they got angry because they knew what he was saying. He was basically telling them, you have your expectations set on one thing. You, you think that you kind of have it figured out already. You, you think you know what to expect from me, but you don't really know what to expect from me. You think you've got it figured out, so you're not really expecting anything else out of my life. But I'm here today to tell you that you're going to miss out because you're not expecting you're, you're missing out because you think you've got it all figured out. And I'm looking for people that know that they don't have it figured out. I'm looking for people that are expecting God to do something. And, and today, in, in, this, in this world today, even in the church world, we, we see that the attendance in church, for example, is declining. We, we see that. It's, you, can, you can look at the chart and you can see it just going down, steadily down. Do you know the average number of times that the average Christian goes to church every month? Do you, do you know? You want to guess? Anybody want to guess? It's not four. That, that would be one. Two. It's not two. It's not even two point something. It's just under two. It's like 1.8. <laughs> the average Christian gathers in church less than two times a month. Just barely. But just interesting why why would that be it used to not be that way 
it used to be that people came to church a lot. Uh, and so it'd be three and, you know, three point something times a month uh, that people would come because maybe somebody is sick or maybe they're traveling or what have you. But, and I, I think, I think I know the reason why. And, and part, and part of it is that there is no expectation. There's no sense of it. We, we think that we know what church is going to be already. We wake up on Sunday and we're like, I don't know. I kind of know what's going to happen on Sunday, and I just don't really feel like that right now. I'd rather go do this other thing. I'd rather sleep in a little bit, whatever, whatever it may be. And so we just don't feel like there's this expectation, this sense of expectation, because we think we've got it figured out. We think we know what's going to happen. We think we know. Well, you know, I've heard that same message like 150 times now. I mean, how many times can you preach the same passage? You'd be surprised. You can preach it a lot. But no one's expecting anything. Or they're not expecting anything different. And so I get it. I get it, right? If you're not expecting anything different, and that's not, that's not really quite what's on the menu for you today, then, yeah, maybe I won't show up, right? And so uh, I don't have to tell you that because you're here. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, you pat yourself on the back today and said, I got up and went to church today. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time preaching to the choir today, as they say. Instead, I want to build on this idea of expectation. I want to build on this idea that God uh, has something for you. And I, I want to, to build your faith today. I want you to walk out of here today feeling like your faith has been built in the things that God wants to do. And so I want to go to this first story. Jesus talked about two stories. Uh, he said there was a widow that Elijah was sent to. And then he says there was a man named Naaman who was a leper. And so I want to talk about both of those just to show you what Jesus is talking about here because it's, it's important. He, he's talking to a bunch of people that had no expectations of him whatsoever other than this is Jesus, the son of Joseph. We think we've got him all figured out. And so he compares them to Israel at the time of this widow and Naaman the Syrian. So I think it's important that we look at these stories. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8, this is Elijah, and he's, and he's speaking with God. God is speaking to him, and it says this. It says, the Lord's message came to him. That's Elijah. Get up and go to Zarephath in Sidonia and, go, and live there. I have already told a widow who lives there to provide for you. In other words, I've already made a way for you, Elijah. There's a widow that lives there. I want you to go to see her. I've already told her that you're coming. And so he got up and he went to Zarephath and he went through the city gate and there was a widow gathering wood. And he called out to her, please give me a little water and a cup so I can take a drink. And as she went to get it, he called out to her. She's, she's on her way to get this. He says, oh, and please bring me a piece of bread while you're at it. And she said, as certainly as the Lord your God lives, I have no food except for a handful of flour and a jar and a little olive oil and a jug. And right now, I'm gathering a couple of sticks for a fire. Then I'm going to go home and make one final meal for my son and myself. After we've eaten that, we're going to die of starvation. Well, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lousy expectation. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do as you planned. But first, make a small cake and bring it to me. Then make something for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel has said. The jar of flour will not be empty, and the jug of oil will not run out until the day the Lord makes it rain on the surface of the ground. And that's exactly what happened. She went back to her house. She made a little fire. She made a little cake with what she had. She brought it to the prophet. When she went back to make the food for her son, there was enough to do that. The next day when she got up to make breakfast, there was enough oil and flour to make the cakes for her her family to eat. The next day, when she got up and she was ready to make the food for that day, there was enough oil and there was enough flour. And the next day, and the next day, and then every time she went back to those jars, there was oil and there was flour, just as God had said. So I want you to, I want you to see this. I, we're, we're reading this, and the Lord told Elijah, he said, there was a widow, and I've already told her that you're coming. And she recognized him. When he came to her and he said, uh, please bring me a drink of water. Please bring me a piece of bread. She said, as, as surely as the Lord your God lives. She understood she was talking to a believer. She understood that she was talking to somebody who, who spoke to God. And she began to, to, uh, to say her situation. So I, I know that she knew he was who he was. I know she recognized that he was a, a believer, that he was the prophet. I know that she recognized that. But I don't know that she had 
the expectation of what was about to happen. He asked her to do something that she wasn't expecting to do. She, she, had a, she knew that she was talking to the prophet. She, God had told her, hey, there's a, there's a man of God coming, and I want you to do what he's going to tell you to do. But she had already set her ideas in a different direction. And so when he came and said, I want you to do this, she's like, whoa, that doesn't quite make sense to me. That doesn't quite meet my expectations, but okay. And she did it, and then God began to supply her need. Uh, every time she went to set the table, he was providing the food that she needed. And I want to tell you today that every time you set your table, that God has promised that he's going to give you everything that you need. Every time that you step out to obey the command of God, the provision to do what he has asked you to do is going to be there. Every time that your feet begin to take the next step of faith, the next step is going to light up after that. Every single time time. God is going to provide for you exactly what you need. I don't want you to be afraid to set your table today. The second story that Jesus told was that of Naaman. And, and so the uh, story picks up in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. It says this, now Naaman, the commander of the king of Syria's army, so he's kind of a big wig in the army, uh, he was esteemed and respected by his master, for through him the Lord had given Syria military victories. But this great warrior had a skin disease, and other translations say he was a leper. He had leprosy, which is a terrible skin disease. And today, in, mo in this modern-day America we live in, we don't really have to worry about leprosy. Uh, all that much. Uh, it's something that can be treated. It's something that we uh, have taken care of. In other parts of the world, not so much. Uh, in the times that uh, the Bible was written, leprosy, even the times of Jesus, was basically a death sentence, a really slow, painful death sentence. And so uh, Naaman has this disease, and so he can't be with his family like he wants to be. He can't be close to people like he wants to be. He has to be super careful about who touches him and who comes close to him because he is a, a leper. And uh, in verse 2 says this, Raiding parties went out from Syria and took captive from the land of Israel a young girl who became a servant to Naaman's wife. And so she was captured in the land of Israel. And she told her mistress, If only my master talking about Naaman, were in the presence of the prophet who is in Samaria, then he would cure him of his skin disease. And so word of this gets to, gets to Naaman. And, uh, and so I'm just kind of paraphrasing some of the story here. Word of this gets to Naaman, and Naaman says, okay, there's a prophet that can, that can heal me of this disease. Well, great, I would like to know who this is. So he sends a message to the king and says, uh, I need you to heal me of, of leprosy. And the king's like, I don't know how to heal you of leprosy. What are you talking about? Uh, you must be talking about Elisha. And so let's, let's uh, send you to Elisha, the prophet of God. And so uh, Naaman goes to Elisha's house. And in verse 9 it says, Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood in the doorway of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent out a messenger who told him, uh, get this, he's standing at the door of Elisha's house waiting for Elisha to come out. Elisha doesn't even come out. He sends a servant out instead, a messenger who says, Go wash seven times in the Jordan River. Your skin will be restored and you'll be healed. Naaman went away angry. He said, Look, I thought for sure he would come out, stand there, invoke the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the area, and those who kind of, you know how preachers do, and cure the, sin, cure the skin disease. I, I, I thought that when I came saying, I need to be healed of this, that the prophet would come out. He'd be dressed a certain way. He would look a certain way. Maybe he'd have a staff in his hand. Maybe he'd have some anointing oil or something like that. And he would approach me. We would exchange pleasantries. And then he would, you know, do some stuff and say, in the name of the Lord, God of Israel, and move my hands a certain way, and then I'll be healed. I, I thought that's what would happen. And you're just telling me to go, like you just sent a messenger said, just go wash in the River Jordan seven times. Just dip down under water seven times and, you're, and you'll be healed. And he got mad and, and he didn't really want to do that. That was not his expectation. That's not what he was expecting. That's not what he thought it should be, what, what he thought should happen. And so he, he's angry and he's, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. And so one of, one of his attendants says, look, you know, if, 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 you try it, you know, maybe, maybe it'll work. I mean, you should, you, you should go and you should do it. I mean, I know this wasn't what you're expecting. I know that's not what you, you thought was going to happen, but uh, maybe you should do it. I mean, what, what if you get healed that way, right? I mean, surely uh, the pro he's a prophet. He would know, right? And so Naaman went and he washed in the, in the Jordan River seven times. And when he came out the seventh time, his skin was like baby skin. And he was healed. 
And so Naaman had the wrong expectation of how the prophet would respond, but at least he had the expectation of a miracle. I look at that and I say, you know, he had the wrong idea. He, he kind of thought he had the how figured out, uh, but he got the what right anyway. He knew that, that God was going to do something. He had an expectation that he was going to be healed, just like the widow woman. She knew the prophet was coming, but uh, their ideas and concepts weren't quite what they were expecting, but they, they did what they were told anyway, and God met their need. You see, we can't predict how a scenario is going to play out. A lot of times we, we try to do that. I try to do that. I think, of, I think that I'm kind of smart most of the time and, uh, and I have pretty good intuition and all that. And so I, I think that I can figure things out. And I think I can say, well, if this happens, then this will happen and this will happen and then we should respond this way. And more often than not, I'm exactly right. No, I'm kidding. Uh, more often than not, there's always, there might be like the first couple of steps work out but then something else happens that you have to adjust uh, to do. In other words, I can't predict how something's going to turn out. I, I don't know how a particular scenario is going to play out. I, I don't always know how God is going to provide in any given situation. Not, I don't even know how a church service is going to go. How about I'm just being very transparent with you today. I, don't, I show up for church on Sunday and we walk into this building and, and I don't even know what's, I don't, I don't know how it's going to go. It goes different every single Sunday. Some days it's like everything works like clockwork, and some days it doesn't work like clockwork. Some days it's a broken clock, and we have to fix it and then make the clock work. And so that happens sometimes, okay? I don't know. I can't predict all that, and neither can you. But I can come, and I can expect something to happen. Uh, I, I can literally show up and say, I got nothing. I mean... I set the table. I got nothing, but I'm expecting something. And the something I'm expecting is exactly what I'm going to need. It's going to be exactly what you are going to need as well. You see, these plates uh, here and the, the plate in the story of my grandfather and grandmother uh, represents an expectation. An expectation that God is going to do what he said he would do. Naaman, when he shows up at Elisha's house, has an expectation the widow, when she sees the prophet approaching, has an expectation. And I know that, that many of you showed up today with, I hope you did, with an expectation. A lot of times we come to church and we just have this kind of expectation. This little tiny plate. And what I'm looking for is I'm just looking for something sweet. A little dessert. It'll fit perfectly on there, right? I just need a little, a little slice of pie. A little scoop of ice cream. Maybe a, a little, just cut me off a little piece of cake with extra frosting, right? I'm looking for something sweet and delicious. Some, maybe you, if you could just plate it just right, I could take a little picture and put it on Instagram. Yeah, I'm looking for that part of the service that's just so sweet and delicious that it actually fits on an Instagram quote. That's all I'm looking for. Just that little goodness right there. That's it. That's my expectation. Well, I hope you get that today. I don't know. Some of us come with this kind of expectation. Yeah, this is a salad plate. Just give me something nice and healthy. A little light. I don't want anything too heavy. I'm on a diet. I don't want to be too religious. I don't want to appear to be too spiritual. I don't want to have too close of an encounter with God. Just give me something light and healthy and something to make me, you know, feel good. And, and uh, it's not going you know, to weigh me down. I'm not going to have to uh, chew on it for a while or anything like that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look good, taste good, just kind of light. Just give me that. I hope you get that today. And some people come with a dinner plate. I like dessert. I do. I like, all the, I like all those Instagram quotes that I see from all those famous preachers. I, I like it. They bless me. They taste good. I don't eat salad in real life, but I like light, healthy preaching too. But I really like dinner. Put some, put some meat on there. Put some vegetables on there. Put, a little, put a, some bread on there, some butter or something, you know. I mean, make me, make me a meal. Make me a meal. Like, I, just, I, I need to get full today. I need something that's going to sustain me, something that sticks to my ribs. You may be looking at me going, no, you don't need anything else to stick to your ribs. 
But when I sit down to eat, I like to eat. And some people, they come to church like that. I was like, I'm ready to eat. Make me a meal, right? I like that. This is me. I hope it's you. I didn't come for dinner today. I came for a feast. I came for an experience. I didn't just come for a, well, that, that was nice. Well, that, that was a really satisfying meal. No, I came just to make myself sick. I want the meat sweats. You know what I'm talking about? I want to regret everything. <laughs> God, if you've got it for me, I want it all. I want it all. We set the table in our lives by choosing to act on our faith. I believe that Jesus will save me. Well, then ask him to. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave. I believe I'm going to rise from the grave. Then you choose to be baptized. That's what baptism shows. I believe that God's going to use me in his kingdom. Then step up to be used. I believe that my marriage is going to be restored. I believe that I'm going to have this relationship that is reconciled. Well, then start taking some steps to restoring it. Start taking some steps towards reconciliation. I believe that God has a purpose for my life. Then stop wasting your time on foolish things. I believe that God has planned good things for me. I believe good things are on the way. Well, then stop thinking and speaking negativity. I believe that God is going to provide my every need. Then don't be afraid to give into the kingdom of God. I believe that God is directing my steps. And then don't be afraid to take the next step. I believe, then do. Set the table. If God said, I will provide. If God said, I will lead. If God said, I will give direction. If God said, I will, then set the table. And expect to receive everything that he has promised. Hebrews 11 and 1 is a favorite passage of mine. This is not the only time you've heard me preach on it. This is, not the only, this is not the last time you're going to hear me preach on it. I use it all the time. I just, this is one of those messages you can preach a hundred thousand different ways. So here you go. Here's another one. Hebrews 11 and 1. The faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We talked last week about the substance of things hoped for. That's the strong desire. And strong desire when it sees a way, becomes hope. And when hope begins to trust, then faith is born out of that. You know why? Because desire and, and hope and, and all that, that's part of faith. It's got to be something that you want. It's got to be something that you desire. But then there's this other part. It's the evidence of things not seen. Do you know what that is? That's expectation. I don't see it, but I'm convinced of it. I don't have it yet, but I'm expecting it. See, that's the, that's the part about, about faith that is often missing. We have a lot of desire. We have a lot of hope. But then we miss the expectation part. And that's the, that's the final part of, of faith because the expectation causes us to do something. Hebrews 11 and 6 drives this home. It says this, without faith it is impossible to please him. Speaking of God, you want to please God? Have faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. He that comes to God must believe that he is. You have to believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Here's expectation. I believe that there is a God. I believe that he loves me. I believe he made a way for me. And now I believe that he is a rewarder 
if I began to pursue him diligently, if I go after him, if I reach for him, if I follow him, then I am going to reap the benefits of that. In other words, I expect something good to happen to me. I expect to receive from him whenever I am following him. It's not just, oh, I believe he exists. There's another scripture that says the devil believes that there is one God and he trembles. But he's not expecting much out of him. I believe and I expect. And so we take steps to show that. Without expectation, you just have a lot of hope. You have a lot of desire. But you don't have that other part. We need to get the expectation. I want to build up your expectation today. I want to build up your faith today. Matthew 7 and 7, Jesus is speaking. He says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the door will be opened. Is there any among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will give him a snake? He's being sarcastic. There's sarcasm in the Bible. There you go, there's sarcasm. No, there's nobody in here, if your child came to you and said, may I please have some bread, you go, here, here's a rock, eat that. Not going to do that. They ask for bread, expecting bread, you're going to give them food to eat. If they ask for fish, you're not going to give them a snake. And Jesus says, if you then, although you are evil, I won't go quite that far, I'll let Jesus do it. Although you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We understand this principle. We understand it. We live it. How much more, how much more will he live it? How much more will he give to us if we only would ask of him? Not just sit back and hope. Well, I hope that he gives me some bread. Well, I hope that he gives me some fish. Well, I hope that he gives me what I need. No. Ask, expect, and it will be given. You may have today a lot of desire. You may have turned that desire into a lot of hope, but today it's time for your levels of expectation to rise. You know, one of our core values here is expectant worship. That's, uh, we're going to talk about that in our on-track class some more. But expectant worship, not just passionate worship, not just vibrant worship, not just lively worship, not just modern worship. All those are, those are great words, great adjectives. I love all of those things, but expectant worship. What does that mean? I mean, our whole lives are supposed to be worshiped to God. But what we're talking about is when we gather together and we begin to worship God together, that we worship with a sense of expectancy. That when I begin to worship him, when I begin to call on his name, when I begin to declare how good he is, when I begin to sing of, of all the great things that he thinks about me and feels about me and has planned for me, when I begin to, to think about how wonderful he is, then I expect that I'm going to sense his presence more strongly. His presence is always with us, but there's something about when we come together to corporately worship that we begin to sense him all the more. I, I, I expect to have an encounter with him. I, I expect to not just sense his presence, but that he would begin to, to speak to me. And as I bless him, that he would bless me. And as I ask of him, he would begin to, to give me answers. As I look and think about the next steps that I have for my life in the midst of worship, that's what I do. I, ex I expect that the next steps will begin to reveal themselves. I expect it when I worship. something about his presence. Psalms 104 says this, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. There, there's this promise that when we begin to thank God, we begin to praise God, that we go through his gates, we enter into his courts, we, we appear right before his throne uh, when we come with thanksgiving and blessing on our lips. Psalm 22 and 3 says, You 
Talking about God, are holy, and you are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. When we begin to worship him, we begin to praise him, we begin to lift him up, it is, it, he is like he sits down like a throne upon those praises. His presence becomes known when we begin to worship Him. Psalms 145 and 8 says, The Lord is near to all who call on Him. To all who call on Him in truth. When I begin to call on the name of the Lord, He is near to me. He may not have felt very near this morning. He may not have felt very near when I drove up. But when I begin to worship him, he feels very near to me. It is his presence becomes known. His presence wraps me up. His presence holds me. And when his presence becomes known, there's all kinds of other things that begin to happen. Psalm 29 and 11 says, The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. There is peace in his presence. When I get into the presence of God, everything else feels so small. And I'm filled with peace. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, The Lord is that Spirit, talking about Jesus. Jesus is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When I'm in the presence of God, I am free. When I'm experiencing His presence, I'm expecting liberty. I'm not expecting to be held back. I'm not expecting to to worry what other people are thinking about. I'm, I'm only, it's me and, me and you. I'm worshiping to you right now. I, when I worship, I'm not worshiping for your benefit. I'm worshiping for his and for mine because I'm expecting his presence and I'm expecting that sense of liberty and freedom when his presence shows up. One, Psalm 16 and 8 says this, I have set the Lord always before me He's always right before me. He's always right close by. He's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And so therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh shall also rest in hope. I'm filled with hope in the presence of God. I'm filled with hope. I rest in hope. Psalm 1611 says, You will show the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I am filled with the joy of the Lord when I'm in his presence. These are all things that I expect. When I begin to worship him, when I begin to lift up his name, when I begin to tell him thanksgiving and blessings to him, I, I anticipate and expect his presence and then there is peace, there is joy, there is hope that comes. Psalm 18 and 28 says, Indeed, you light my lamp, Lord. My God illuminates the darkness around me. When you get close to me, it's like a light shining where I need to go. I'm going to receive direction when I'm in your presence. Psalm 84 and 11, The Lord God is our sovereign protector. The Lord bestows favor and honor. He withholds no good thing from those who have integrity. He bestows favor favor. I, I don't know about you, but I need the favor of God in my life. I need, I need people to, to look at me and go, wow, you are blessed and favored of God. I don't know how you do what you do. I don't know how you made it through that. I don't know how you survived through that. I don't know how you dealt with that. I don't know how you do this. I don't know how you dream that. I don't know how you step into that. I don't know how you lay those plans. I don't know how you have joy. I don't know how you have peace. I don't know how you feel a sense of liberty. And you say, it's because when I get into the presence of God, he makes the steps known to me. He's guiding every footstep that I make. That's why the favor of God is in my life. Psalm 23 and 5 says, You prepare a feast before me in plain sight of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup is completely full. My cup is not left with just ice cubes. It's completely full and it's overflowing in the presence of my enemies. You know what that is? That's, that's life. It's life. I, I've, got, I've got strength from my body and I've got this sense of life that just flows into me and out. I, I'm just overflowing with the life of God, the Spirit of God. All of these things happen when I'm in 
His presence. All of these things I expect when I get in His presence. All of these things are promises from the Word of God. I, I didn't make any of this up. This, was, this is written in the Bible. This is written in the, the Holy Bible. This is written in the Word of God that this is what happens when you get into the presence of the Lord. That if you can bless Him, if you can open up your lips and give Him thanks, if you can begin to declare His goodness over you, you will sense His presence around you and you will experience these things. And, and I don't know which one of those you came in needing today. It might be one. It might be all of those. You might have just come in with your little dessert plate today and just, I just need a little bit of this. Or, or maybe you walked in, I need everything that you've got, but God is ready to give. He's ready to fill your plate up. Uh, if you came in with this little plate, you might have to go back to the line a few times to get everything that he's got for you today. But do that. Do that. If you've got to make 10 trips, that's okay. He's not going to run out of provision. He's not going to run out of joy. He's not going to run out of peace. He's not going to run out of favor. He's not going to run out of direction. He's not going to run out of liberty. He's not going to run out of all the things that he is. He's going to provide. Every time you set the table, every time you take the step, every time you choose to act in faith, he will provide. Can we stand in this room today? Worship team, you can come. You see, God may not do what we're trying to anticipate the most. You may, you may have walked in here today and you said, you know, I don't really know what to expect today. So I don't really have any expectations. Maybe, maybe you walked in today and said, well, I'm kind of expecting what we, what we have seen. I'm just kind of, you know, it's gonna, we're going to sing this many songs. We're going to have a message that's about this long. We're going to shake some hands and we're going to go home. And that's kind of my expectation. Or you know, maybe I just need that little nugget. I just need that little, I'm just expecting that little thing from God. Maybe you walked in today and you're expecting something big from God. I, I just, I don't know. But it's probably not how you expect it. It's going to exceed your expectations. See, he's not going to do necessarily what we anticipate the most. He's going to do what we need the most. And he's going to do it in a way that meets our need to the utmost. So today, there is a table set before you, not this literal one here. There is a spiritual table that's set before you. The blessings and the favor and the joy and the peace and the direction that comes from God. He set it before you. And he's saying, I want to fill that plate. I want to pour into your cup until it's overflowing. I want to refresh your soul today. I want, to, I want to do that for you. Would you set the table? Would you go into this song that we're going to, we're going to close out this song? Would you go into this song with a sense of expectation? Wow, I, I didn't know what was gonna, I didn't know what was gonna be preached about today. I didn't know what was gonna happen today. But here we are. And you saw the promises in the word. He is for you. He has something for you. You can choose to believe in him today and be saved. You can ask him to forgive you of your sins today. You can choose to be baptized today. You can ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit today. You can ask him to, to give you direction today. You can ask Him just to, to give you peace today. You can ask Him to renew your joy today. You can ask Him for whatever it is that you, that you need. You just need to have the faith to set the table because it's here and it's ready. We're going to sing. Go ahead and sing with us in expectancy. And God is going to begin to move in your life this week. Today. It begins today. And this week can be very different with expectation. True faith.